Hello, my name is Dr. Joseph McHale. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of the International Myeloma Foundation. We have had an outstanding ASH this year in 2021. Not only were we able to gather to a certain degree in person, it was an amazing year, year for multiple myeloma. I'm just going to give you the rapid fire overview of some of the major abstracts and trends that we saw at ASH this year in multiple myeloma. I'm going to talk about them in five categories and spend less than one minute on each of them. So get ready for a quick overview. Screening. Screening was uh, really quite remarkable this year, especially with the iStop study, where we saw 75,000 people have their blood collected to understand the real incidence of MGUS and plasma cell disorders in Iceland, but also another large screening study, the PROMISE study, in particular high-risk populations like African-American patients and indeed patients who are first-degree relatives of myeloma patients. These studies will take years to give us more and more information, but we're already recognizing that myeloma is perhaps more common than we think, and indeed its precursor condition of MGUS. Number two is the frontline therapies. We saw several studies now pointing us towards moving from triplets to quadruplets in multiple myeloma. In the German uh, GMMG HD7 study, we saw esituximab added to VRD giving us deep responses with over half of patients re reaching MRD negativity with just induction. The Griffin study, adding daratumumab to VRD is showing us now deeper and deeper responses over time. And the master protocol, adding daratumumab to KRD could be a recipe for the opportunity to reduce treatment of patients and maybe even stop patients to re reach a certain depth of response. The third category is early relapse in multiple myeloma. We saw several abstracts with all of the new options that we have of mixing and matching the different classes of drugs we have with proteasome inhibitors, immunomodulatory drugs, and monoclonal antibodies, and now indeed XPO1 inhibitors with Selenexor. We saw some great work showing that we can use Selenexor after daratumumab, not just practically, but biologically having a basis for it being able to combine Selenexor with other partners like pomalidomide so that we have even more options in that early relapse setting. Area number four was the late relapse. And this is perhaps where we saw the most work at ASH. In CAR T cell therapy, we saw jaw dropping response rates to the CARTITUDE 1 study where we saw that patients had a 98% response rate in patients receiving Siltacel, uh, this novel CAR T cell therapy that will likely be approved in the not so distant future. Uh, and this was generally quite tolerable, although of course there is cytokine release syndrome and potential for neurotoxicity. We're getting better and better at uh, caring for these patients and for preventing these conditions. We even saw an inter interesting abstract of adding a gamma secretase inhibitor to enhance BCMA expression so that we may be able to even further benefit from the BCMA strategies that we have. Not only did we see this in the late relapse setting, we saw a whole host of bispecific therapies, teclistamab, telquetamab, Regeneron or REGN5458, Sivostimab, ABV383, uh, 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 Elratinab. El we have a whole series of these uh, really remarkable bispecific agents that can adhere to the tumor but also engage directly T cells, whether they engage uh, the tumor through BCMA or uh, FCRH5 or GPRC5D, we've seen some common threads between all of these bispecific antibodies. They're very effective between uh, about 55 and 80% response rates, so more than double what we've typically seen with single agents. There is generally manageable cytokine release syndrome, mostly grade one and some grade two, uh, and that most of the side effects are manageable with these agents. And so we really feel that this could bring the concept of T-cell therapy more easily delivered to patients instead of having to go through uh, the, the T-cell collection like we typically do with CAR T-cell therapy. But also in the late relapse setting, we saw a few wild card agents. We saw more data on ibertamide, which is a new class of cell mods uh, that is an oral agent quite easily tolerated. 
uh, and really a whole new uh, class of drugs bringing back interferon in, in the form of TAC573, or now it's called Modacafusp, which is a drug that uh, in a different way delivers interferon that we know can be helpful uh, in multiple myeloma. And lastly, the fifth category, particularly dear to my heart, and one that we're going to do a whole separate video on, so I'm just going to give you a few words about it, is health disparities in multiple myeloma. We know that this is a grave problem in our country and around the world. Myeloma is twice as common in the African-American population, and yet we see that survival is perhaps half of what it should be when compared to the Caucasian population. So many abstracts looked at the cause for this, but also looking at some of the solutions, like greater inclusion of African-Americans in therapies, in clinical trials, and indeed in CAR T-cell therapy. So a fantastic year at ASH. So much to take in, uh, but really, after being in myeloma for over 20 years, this may be the most exciting year I've seen in new agents in multiple myeloma.